from everybody. And so I want to start off, I think, just with some introductions for the panel, which I think is always important. Um, Madam Secretary, I believe that's what I call you. Why don't you go first, Ben, and then on he will go last. Go ahead, Madam Secretary. Okay. Uh, well, hello. I'm Secretary of State Kim Wyman from Washington, and I have uh, been conducting elections for over 27 years at both the county and the state level. And uh, here in Washington, we have been voting by mail as a state since 2011, but have a long history of uh, expanded absentee voting and really had about a 20 year ramp up before we became a completely vote by mail state. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today about our close contested election because we did have the closest governor's race in the country's history in 2004. Awesome. And we're definitely going to get into that. Ben, why don't you go ahead? Hi, I'm Ben Ginsberg. Thanks very much for having me and a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I've been a Republican election lawyer uh, since the 1980s been involved in all aspects of campaigns from the presidential to the city council level, uh, been involved in uh, election day operations and uh, representing campaigns and candidates in that period. Mm -hmm. Lon, go, go ahead. Uh, hey, I'm Lon Chen. I'm a fellow at the Hoover Institution and I teach public policy uh, and occasionally law at Stanford University. I served as the policy director for the Romney campaign in, in 2012 and now uh, do a lot of teaching on uh, on aspects of policy making and American democracy. And uh, it's great to be with this group. Yeah, it's I'm really excited to, to start off with this. And so obviously, here we are one week to go till the election. It almost can't believe uh, that it's almost here. But now that it is, I'm like, gosh, can't we just get it over with? Can't we get the results? Probably the way that many Americans are going to feel on Election Day itself which is a good, good segue into this. This is a discussion both about you know possible close election, but also election integrity and so much more. And I think that I'd like to start off just from, you know, from some brief thoughts from all three of you, just about how you see the most important issues for Americans to consider and to know in the possibility of a close election and that if things were to get contested, what are the what are the assurances that they can have that their vote matter, that their vote counts, and that ele this election has integrity? Madam Secretary, can we start with you? Oh, absolutely. I, I like I said, I've been doing elections for a very long time now, and I've never seen an election cycle quite like this one. Um, first and foremost, we already have over 200 legal uh, filings and, and litigation um, across the country this early. We haven't, you know, we haven't even really started voting yet. I mean, we have, but not not in earnest. Election day isn't here, so that really, I think, is really. Um, pointing to what's going to happen after election day when we know results and now the stakes get higher. So I, I like to remind people that there are over 10,000 election officials like myself who oversee elections at the state and, and local level. And uh, we're all working very hard to make sure that our voters who we answer to are well served. We're making sure that there are in-person voting opportunities, that there are mail-in opportunities for those that can't vote at home or can't vote in a polling place. And states like mine that are completely vote by mail, making sure that every eligible person has a chance to uh, register and vote. And right now with seven days to go, that is our complete and total focus. But make no mistake, we're anticipating, at least here in Washington, 90% turnout. Wow. 90% turnout. And I do think we're going to hit it. We're on track. Uh, we've already received back almost 50% of our ballots. So that's huge volume. Our, our states have, have ramped up for it. Many states are doing absentee voting and vote by mail for the first time in really large numbers. So it is going to slow down ballot counting potentially. And that doesn't mean anything is wrong. It means that people are taking their time doing their job. So we're going to need a lot of patience. Go ahead, Ben. Well, what, what Secretary Wyman says really encapsulates this election. First of all, there's obviously a, a great, great deal of interest in it. And it comes at a time when our country has never been more polarized and we're dealing with a pandemic. So that will put stresses on the system where there probably haven't been them before. Also putting stress on that is that this is a first time the president of the United States has said the elections themselves are fraudulent and the results rigged. Um, having 
been in polling places for the last 38 years looking for that frog, because I think it's always important for the parties to have their poll watchers looking for problems and to be able to validate the elections at the end. But the president has insufficient evidence to make the case that, that these results are fraudulent. But that will put pressure on what the secretary said about the counting of ballots. And having looked at this system for a long time, having been co-chair of a presidential commission several years ago that looked at the issue in depth, what I take the most solace from is the state and local officials like Secretary Wyman. Uh, as she said, there are over 10,000 jurisdictions, uh, but uh, I came away from that experience really impressed with the people on the local level who will make the election run, and if there are problems, we'll fix them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Lonnie. Uh, look, I think we're going to learn a lot from this election cycle. Uh, this is a, an unprecedented cycle. I mean, I know we've heard that. It's been discussed in the media, but it's true. I mean, you think about the backdrop for this, uh, for this election. You have a global pandemic that continues to affect parts of the United States in really significant ways. Uh, you have people who are trying to express uh, their views politically. It is a very polarized time, as Ben noted. You've got people who have very strongly held opinions. And so you combine that with the, the, the fact that we are in this unprecedented backdrop, I think we're going to learn a lot. And I think one of the things we're going to learn about is, you know, what are best practices when we think about how to deal with a situation where people aren't voting in person as much, where there are questions about the legitimacy uh, of the election, not necessarily about the legitimacy, legitimacy of the election, but that mm. there have been concerns expressed by some about the legitimacy of the election. So I, I think the question really comes down to, what kind of reforms might we see coming out of this? Will there be an effort, for example, to standardize more of what we do? The fact that we basically have thousands of different kinds of elections around the country. When I talk to friends and colleagues and collaborators uh, in other countries, they're, 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 they find that to be you know, quite strange that we have this system in America. I think some of that is really great, that we allow for regional and local variation. We recognize that not all states are the same, not all people in those states are the same. On the other hand, I think it suggests a great need for us as a country to take a good hard look at what we're doing and ask, is this the kind of system that best ensures people are heard and that they are expressed in the right way uh, given this time of polarization we're seeing? So I I'm looking forward to after the election uh, mm. to see kind of what we can draw from this and how we can we can continue to improve our system of democracy. I think that raises an interesting question. I'd throw it back to you, Madam Secretary, which is that I think mail-in balloting has been the chief, you know, the chief kind of concern, the issue area raised by the president, discussed by many Republicans. Now, given your own stature within the state and your own, you know, your own role, and also running you know, one of these mail-in ballot elections, just tell us about your experience having run this election currently um, in the past. And maybe dismiss or affirm some of the common concerns around mail-in voting. And then I'd also like to kick it over to my other panelists here um, after your response, just to see if they have anything to add, or maybe even they can ask you as the only elected official on the panel. So go ahead, ma'am. So Washington's experience is pretty unique because we really started this in the 1980s when we started allowing people who were living with disabilities or those over age 65 to be on permanent absentee status, meaning they got an absentee ballot automatically every election. In 1993, we expanded that to any registered voter. And by the late 1990s, our state was really effectively already vote by mail because one in six, or excuse me, six in 10 voters were getting an absentee ballot every election. And all of this rolled along until 2004 when we had the closest governor's race in the country's history. And we realized that you can't do two elections simultaneously with the available resources we had at the time uh, well. And so in 2005, our legislature allowed us to move completely to vote by mail, by county, by choice. And it still took our state another six years before it was completely a vote by mail state, partly because of logistics and partly because of politics. And so I say all of that because we had a nice 
not always smooth, but a, a nice ramp up over, you know, a couple of decades. Whereas uh, a lot of these states had to do the same ramp up over a couple of months. So right. that is the heart of the thing that I think I am most concerned about. Uh, we've done everything we can here in Washington to give our colleagues policies and procedures and build in the safeguards that we have here to, you know, really balance out all of that access that you're giving by sending every eligible voter a, a ballot. You have to have the compensating security measures to make sure that people believe the results. And I worry that uh, because the states have gone so fast that they're not going to be perfect. We all know that that elections are never perfect. But uh, when you get in the spotlight of this, this race, um, it's going to be very difficult difficult to have a, uh, an election that doesn't have all of those things in place and have people walk away believing it. Mm -hmm. Ben, let me, uh, let me kick that to you. Just given her answer of just, you know, expressing rightfully, you know, we should, there is very possible that there could be some issues just from logistics of states that have had to ramp up there. You said you haven't seen any evidence of fraud. Is it not just fraud though, that might cast aspersions on the results of the election? It could be incompetence. It could be simply delays, not of anybody's particular fault, but it just could simply result. How should we think about that as Americans heading into a possibly close election? Well, uh, I, first of all, I think I said widespread mm -hmm. fraud. There are to be sure isolated incidents of fraud that have been right. found out and dealt with, but that's different from, systematic fraud that would taint the results of an election. But I think um, something that Kim said, and Kim's perspective is particularly interesting because she's also on the ballot this year as a candidate. So I'm interested in, <laughs> in hearing about that as well. Um, but when you do have ten, over 10,000 jurisdictions, uh, there will be uneven applications and there will be difficulties. There are every cycle, where problems are spotted, but they are fixed uh, during the, the different procedures that individual states have laid out in contests and recounts in other judicial proceedings. Um, so I, I think that with this onslaught of mail ballots, you, you may well have a different set of circumstances. It could take longer to count them. Although I think with the exception of about three states, uh, at least the processing of the absentee ballots is going to happen in advance of election day. So that may not be much of a, uh, as much of a bottleneck as um, people think in, in getting out the results. But to be sure, this is a very human process. Mm -hmm. Most polling places are staffed by, by volunteers. Uh, there are an estimated over a million people who will be volunteering their time to work in the polls. We've decided as a country to make this a very local and volunteer-based system. So yes, there are going to be problems. Again, uh, I, I do have confidence in the local and state officials to work through those problems. Go ahead, Lonnie. Yeah, I mean, I think this is exactly the, the nub of the question, which is we at how quickly some states have had to make the transition to uh, not totally different systems, but systems where they are having to accommodate a lot of things for the first time. They are testing their infrastructure for the first time. You know, it, it's one thing to have to validate signatures on, you know, uh, let's say a few tens of thousands of ballots. It's quite another to have to do it on hundreds of thousands of ballots. So I do think that that it will be a it, it will be a tremendous challenge. I think. Uh, in, in that sense. But I think it's also, as I, as I noted earlier, I think it's a learning opportunity for us to figure out exactly uh, how it is that states accommodate what works and what doesn't in this situation, whether there will in fact be more of a need for, if it's a funding issue, if it's an infrastructure mm -hmm. issue, you know, kind of getting to the bottom of those things, I think will be very valuable for us as a country going forward. But there's no question, this year's election is different. And, and you know, there have been concerns previously about widespread mail-in balloting and what that means for uh, for the system. And I think we'll learn a lot from what happens uh, this week going into next Tuesday. I certainly think so. One thing, Madam Secretary, I'd like to kick back to you is that it would be extraordinarily valuable, I think, for people who are watching this just to perhaps understand the physical mechanism of what goes into counting ballots. So from the, if you could take us, you know, through the process from the beginning of it's printed, it's mailed to you, 
then, you know, somebody else puts it back in a drop in box or elsewhere, just based upon your experience. And then if you could lay out, you know, if there is to be concern expressed by the American people, um, just about the integrity of that process, whether you think that that's valid or not, because I think a lot of people just don't know. So please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, so remember that our election system is built on a whole overlapping layers of physical and electronic controls that are designed for accountability and transparency and accuracy. And so, um, from the beginning when we mail out ballots and our, our th in a, here in our state, I'll just use our state as an example. We have 39 county auditors who are overseeing the elections for their counties and they are preparing the mailing for their county, which may be, you know, 1600 people or maybe 1.3 million people. And uh, they do that in, in co uh, concert with vendors. They get the mailing, they make sure that every voter gets the exact right ballot based on their address. And uh, during that whole process, they're controlling all of that. They know how many ballots are printed, how many were distributed and where they were sent. They're put into the mail stream with the USPS, again, with lots of controls, intelligent mail barcode, for example, so we know how many ballots were mailed out. And if we start seeing problems in that mailing, we can you know, dive into the actual post office that may have a, tr a tray or an entire rack of ballots that haven't been distributed and work with the post office to have those controls on the front end. Once ballots are received by voters, they mark them, uh, they put them into a security sleeve. I think that we learned about chads in 2000. Yes. Uh, I, I think naked ballots are going to be the modern day <laughs> chad, uh, from what I can tell. Uh, but the security sleeve is what's really protecting the voters' individual choices and keeping their name and those choices separate because that's one thing election officials have to do is maintain voter secrecy. Then that security sleeve is put into an outer envelope with the voters identifying information and the voter attests to an oath that's on the outside of that envelope. They can either put that into a ballot drop box, which is maintained by our county officials. They're picked up regularly and have dual control environments where two people pick those ballots up, sign in logs, account for each ballot that they take out of the drop boxes, or it's put into the mail stream in a, a blue USPS mailbox. And again, it's tracked through their systems and their internal barcoding system. When it arrives at election offices, the first thing they do is account for every ballot they receive. And uh, their job is really to reconcile by the end of the election back to that original count. We received a million ballots. We counted all but 5,000 of them. The 5,000 we didn't count were rejected and here's why. And they have to be able to get to that level of precision for people to believe it in a close race. And I speak from experience because right. I've been a recount when it doesn't happen and it's not pleasant. Um, and uh, after they do that initial count, they are verifying the signature of the envelope to a signature on the voter registration file. Uh, that's done by trained staff. And if they find it doesn't match, they notify the voter. That does two things. One gives the voter a second chance to have their ballot counted. More importantly, it's a fraud check. Because uh, if I guarantee you, if uh, Benjamin Ginsburg gets a letter from his county official that says his ballot uh, signature doesn't match and hasn't voted, he's going to call and report it. And now we can start a fraud investigation. Then finally, after that signature is matched and we verify that the voter has only voted once, we give them credit in their voter history. That means no additional ballot can come in from them and be counted. We separate out the name from the envelope, the security envelope or sleeve, and then we prepare the ballots by for, uh, for scanning and uh, processing. All of that's happening in various stages in different states. Like my state, we're doing that right now. All of that work's happening as we speak. Some states have to wait until much closer to election day to do some of that processing, but no state is gonna release any results or reports until eight o'clock or when their polls close on election night. And then that processing in our state will actually continue for another 20 days after election day because we have a postmark requirement for our ballots. Right. Well, uh, could you describe, yeah. could, could I jump in with a question? Could you describe the mail barcode a little bit more? Does that include a date in case a postmark gets messed up? 
Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I'm not totally sure on the postal service system, but uh, if you look on any piece of mail that you get commercially at your home, look at the bottom of your address and you'll notice a barcode. And that's what the USPS refers to as the intelligent mail barcode. And that they can track it, each individual piece of mail. Uh, those of you who have informed delivery get actual an email every day that shows what mail is going to be in your mailbox that day. All of that comes from that intelligent mail barcode. And then when those ballots are returned in the return envelopes, we also have uh, similar barcodes on it that we can use for tracking and the USPS can use for tracking. And then the USPS also sprays on a fluorescent barcode. Uh, again, you probably have never noticed it until now on your, your mail piece. And we can scan that and we can actually get the postmark off of that uh, orange fluorescent barcode that probably has a name that I can't think of right now. Sager, can I just add one thing here that, that's interesting, which is that in a, in a number of states, there are kind of unprecedented ways that one can trace their ballot, you know, in, mm -hmm. a, in a similar way you might t trace a UPS package. California here, for example, there's a website you can go on. I filled out my ballot last weekend. I took it to the local public library. There's a drop box outside. I put the ballot in. That night, the ballot was shown as having been received by the registrar recorder county clerk here in Santa Clara County, California, where I live. The next day it was shown as counted and then verified. And I know that my ballot was actually received, or at least to the best of my ability, no one ever knows for sure, I suppose. But, you know, to the best of one's ability, we were able to see that that had happened. And I think a number of states have tried to do that. I think transparency is one of the keys here. You know, I was an election observer in Taiwan for their presidential mm -hmm. election in January. They have the world's most low tech but unhackable election system possible. They do paper ballots, people vote, and then when they count them, they literally invite people to stand there and watch them dump the ballots out and they read each ballot individually. Who voted, you know, who was voted for for the presidential, for the legislative election, and that tally is then confirmed there on the spot. It is forwarded to a central election center. They accumulate all that information. It's incredibly low tech, but I was struck by how well it works. Now, it's easy to do it in a small country, hard right. to do it in a country of 300 some odd million people. But one of the things I would say is we can learn something from other countries and what they're trying to do to make their elections and make democracy more transparent, but also more accessible to more people. I think that's an important point. And just before we even move on more to the foreign piece, which I think is important as well, Ben and Lonnie, I want to just get your reactions to that process. And it strikes me that the two you know, points in which that this is going to be scrutinized the most is going to be on the Postal Service front. Um, as we've seen in the media currently, and it's going to be on those any sort of rejected ballot, be it naked, um, be it signature. So, Ben, let's start with you. Are there legitimate concerns to be had about any of those? Can you allay people's concerns or maybe just give them some more information? Well, I think I think allay people's concerns um, more to the point. And I would also uh, add the point the, or the time frame when ballot signatures can actually be challenged. Mm -hmm. In other words, in some states, uh, poll watchers or observers from the party are allowed to question whether the signatures match. And to the extent that's in a battleground state or a key Senate state, that can become an important piece as well. But the secretary's descriptions of the intricacies of the process um, I think should allay many concerns that this is just some haphazard uh, procedure that that's been thrown in. In fact, we have been using absentee ballots, mail-in ballots for uh, for decades, and so the systems are are actually pretty well defined. I think the other thing to remember is that the way the process works is that this is really a precinct by precinct or sometimes county by county exercise. So it gets broken down into, into small components where people in your community are the one who are actually making the judgments about individual ballots. Um, having said that, the signature match uh, that you mentioned is going to be um, a really important and difficult factor in a number of jurisdictions just because, number one, I, I, I don't think many people use the same signature consistently. 
And honestly, the folks I know who are under 30 barely pick up a pen for anything, let alone for for signing a ballot. So I think there are some things that are that are prone to difficulties in there. But states like Washington, if you've got a way to cure uh, questionable signatures, then that goes a long way to alleviating the concerns in those states. Mm-hmm. Lonnie, what do you think about those uh, those entry points for criticism and how it might play out over the election and the validity of it as well? Yeah, look, some of those criticisms uh, and questions, I think, are fair questions to be asking. The capacity of the Postal Service to handle the volume we're looking at. We talked earlier about the ability of of counties and local jurisdictions to stand up the infrastructure they need to ensure that all the points of verification are available. You know, look, I guess I would say a couple things. One is um, everyone I've spoken to who's involved in this process at some level is trying as hard as they can and devoting as many resources as they have to ensuring that they can accomplish this well and do it in a way that gives people comfort that the process was followed and there was no illegitimacy involved uh, in in the collection of the ballots, the counting of them or any other part of the process. So that's point number one. Point number two is I would say that that we we probably still have a, a ways to go. And, and I think in terms of understanding, you know, this election is not going to come off perfectly. Uh, there are going to be some scenarios and situations that will get reported on where there will be questions. And I think the most important thing in those situations is for the authorities who are involved to be transparent about what's happened, about the nature of the process, where there may have been difficulty. I think people are much more likely to have faith and confidence in the process if transparency is a theme that's followed and followed closely. And the last thing I would say is, I I think, you know, I'll echo a point the secretary made earlier, which is, we need to be patient about this year's process. It is potentially gonna take some time. And even if we don't know everything, chapter and verse on election night, that doesn't mean that the process is somehow broken. In some cases where, for example, ballot counting cannot begin until very late in the process, it's gonna take time to do this the right way and to do it well. And I just think it's important for those who report on this, for those who are part of this process to emphasize that the responsible approach is to recognize it, it's going to take time potentially. And, and that that's not a satisfactory thing. We as Americans want our answers and we want them now. Uh, but but that's not necessarily going to be possible in every single situation this year. Yeah. And, and of course, the closeness of the results in any election and, and overall in the country is going to be the determinant factor on how much any of this gets scrutinized. Mm-hmm. So if if a state is not in the balance uh, for the presidency and maybe for a contested Senate race, then folks really are not going to have a reason to to knock open the hood and take a look. And um, as the secretary mentioned that 200, that 2004 or 2002 gubernatorial recount, um, recounts are something where you do see the warts of the system, but absent recounts you don't necessarily get there for all this scrutiny that that we can imagine i think that's an important point as well and i think that now we focus kind of on the mail-in system i think we should turn to foreign as well because that's something that the department of homeland security and many others have said that we should watch out for madam secretary i want to start with you i mean as somebody out of course again you know who's involved within the process whenever we see accusations speculation and more about foreign interference possibly you know foreign actors trying to manipulate our electoral system how would you allay you know anybody who's watching this as concerns about that, about the integrity of your system, about your partnerships with the federal government as the perspective of somebody who is actually involved in that process. And then Ben and Lonnie will discuss that a little bit further. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, election officials, at least here, I'll again talk specifically to my Mm -hmm. state. Um, We've been thinking about cybersecurity from the moment we started putting out election night results. So 10, 15 years ago, uh, once you start putting things on the internet, you have to be aware that you could be um, hacked or, or some some sort of attack. So, uh, but I think in 2016, that uh, concern level went up a hundredfold. And uh, we have spent the last four years focused 
laser focused on cybersecurity. And uh, luckily, Congress really did see the need. Uh, our state was a recipient of about $20 million of uh, money that was devoted specifically to uh, ramping up that cybersecurity in 2018 with the night of 2020. Uh, we were in the midst of uh, bringing up a new modernized uh, voter registration system. And so we were able to build in the security measures we really wanted, not just the minimum we could get by with, and so we've, you know, increased our firewalls. We have very robust monitoring systems. We created a uh, cybersecurity operations center that's devoted entirely to our election system and that of the, the 39 counties that are connected to it. Um, so we've been able to do a lot of things both uh, physically and, and electronically to boost that cyber presence and, and awareness level and a lot of training. We've done uh, tabletop exercises. And I think one of the, the best things that happened to our country country, quite frankly, is uh, when Jay Johnson, the director of Homeland Security in 2017, made the election system part of critical infrastructure for the United States. Uh, make no mistake, we are under attack by our foreign adversaries. And they don't want to help one candidate or hurt another candidate. They want to bring down democracy. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want to sound so dramatic, but but their their intention and their goal is very big. It's a very big chess move, and it started long before 2016. And so election officials, I guess, to make people feel better, uh, we are aware of that, and we, because of the designation of critical infrastructure, have been able to work with federal partners in a way we couldn't do four years ago. We now are, you know, in fact, we're almost on daily calls with uh, the cybersecurity part of Homeland Security called CISA. Uh, we're getting alerts constantly. We're sharing information in a way we couldn't do four years ago. And so we're, we're in a, per, a security posture that we weren't in in 2016, and we're ready for what's coming at us in the next, you know, seven days, but also the next uh, two months, because I don't think it's going to end on election day. And uh, we're we're not only combating all of the malware and, and cyber attacks that we might see, but misinformation and disinformation as well. So uh, I think what, what people can take away is we've done everything we can to make sure we're, uh, we're ready and we're going to fight back hard to protect your vote and protect your information. Certainly. Ben and Lonnie, well, Ben in particular, uh, let's start with you about in your observation of the election process and your knowledge there, what are the assurances that the Americans have here around foreign interference, particularly if we have different candidates or, you know, politically motivated um, claims around outcomes of elections? How should we evaluate those claims with evidence? What would we want to look for? And then given what we know about what the defenses look like, can we be assured it's not a likely possibility? Well, I think we can be assured of a couple of mm -hmm. things. Number one is that there are our enemies who will try something. Uh, and I think we should um, take some confidence in the fact that 2016 uh, really scared straight uh, the secretaries of state around the country. They saw what could happen. Uh, I do take comfort, and I think none of the secretaries of state want to be the one who uh, who is found to have been hacked and their results right. um, manipulated. So the, the DHS folks and the CISA folks have uh, really done a comprehensive job in helping states with that. Of course, the unnerving part of this conversation and where the conspiracy theories start is you don't know what you don't right. know. And so if you assume that very smart people with bad motives are going to try or at least could try to hack things, then it's really a matter of constant vigilance. And there is uh, a huge responsibility on the social media platforms and on candidates <clears throat> excuse me, and public officials, to be sure that the charge is backed up with real evidence uh, of something gone amiss. And uh, the, the voters of the country really have a responsibility to hold those public officials accountable for broad-based charges that don't come with a lot of evidence. Behind. Right. I think that's an important point to keep in mind. Lonnie, I'd like your perspective there, both upon how we should think, consider uh, foreign interference as people who want to see the election with integrity, how we should evaluate candidate claims. But I'd also love just some insight as you were talking about 
you know, the People's Republic of China has an immense incentive in order to try and screw with their um, election results. So what can we see in turn? Well, how can we see how other countries who are under foreign interference and pressure have dealt with those threats? What might we have learned and have incorporated into our system? Well, a lot of a number of different issues there. So first of all, what we've seen over the last couple of years is truly a proliferation in the number of state actors who are trying to impact our elections in some way, whether it's through direct intervention uh, in the form of cybercrime or, uh, you know, impacting the dialogue via disinformation campaigns. And we've seen that now from uh, we know now from state actors like Iran and Russia the People's Republic of China has also been guilty of it. There are other countries, North Korea, no doubt, who would love to interfere with our election in some way. So th what, what we really know now is that the proliferation in the number of state actors trying to effectuate some influence on our elections has grown. And it's something that the more we know, the better off we are. The more information mm -hmm. that our state and local authorities have about active efforts to sow uh, you know, some kind of lack of credibility or, or, or uncredibility in our electoral system, the more we know about that, the better. So that's the first thing. I think we know a lot more now uh, than, frankly, we did back in, in 2016 even. We, we just have a lot more capacity to detect and understand what our adversaries are trying to do to disrupt our, our system of democracy. Uh, you mentioned Taiwan. It's interesting. So they were actually the tip of the spear in terms of some of the disinformation uh, campaigns of the Chinese Communist Party from the from the Chinese mainland, from the People's Republic of China. Uh, and what we saw in Taiwan was a successful pushback on a lot of that, in particular because of the strength of governmental institutions, but also of civil society. So let me talk a little bit about each of those. With respect to government, what we saw was a tremendous effort by uh, by the Department of Justice in Taiwan, as well as local prosecutor's offices to identify the, the rampant uh, sources of disinformation that were coming from mainland China, to identify them, to publicly out them, if you will. And, and that, I think, helped to warn the Chinese, quite frankly, that they couldn't just come in and, and systematically mess with, uh, with the Taiwanese election process. There were strong uh, anti-involvement, uh, anti disinformation laws that were passed in Taiwan uh, in the lead up to the election in 2016. And the other thing that frankly played a big role, Asagar, was civil society in yeah. Taiwan. Civil society institutions, nonprofit groups, uh, folks out there identifying disinformation, but also identifying efforts to systematically interfere with Taiwan's election. Those were all very helpful in terms of fending off uh, any kind of efforts from the PRC. Remember, Taiwan's only 80 miles from China. So China really thought they could interfere with that presidential election, uh, but but they didn't. And I think that's good news for advocates of democracy around the world. It certainly is. So I know that one of our panelists has to leave at around three o'clock. So I want to start my call here for uh, audience questions. If you want to start letting those flow in and then we will get them passed on. And if they're good, then I'll ask them. Um, I get to be the the bulwark. Sorry, everybody. That's moderator privileges. I think we want to stick uh, a little bit with it's interesting, is around integrity and the closeness of the election. That's obviously where we want to focus most. So if we could return, I think, to that recount, Madam Secretary, that you were talking about, the some of the exposures in the system that we might have learned from that. And then to the rest of the panel, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've talked, uh, I think was in the description here, but the 1876 scenario, something nobody here wants to repeat, um, but certainly could. I mean, it's possible. Anything is possible. So Madam Secretary, what are some of those lessons that we learned in that very close recount election that you were involved in? And then based on those experiences, I want the rest of the panel to weigh in that with the 1876 in mind. Go ahead, ma'am. Oh, absolutely. We learned uh, three key takeaways that have really helped us refine our vote by mail system. Uh, and and as you know, as as we've all been talking about on this panel, uh, those close elections, no one really cares about the mechanics of an election, but I guarantee you attorneys really zero in on things when uh, when there's a couple of votes separating the winner and the loser. So right. uh, the 
other thing that we've been sharing is that you you really need to look at what your resources are in your organization and uh, what your throughput is in terms of volume. And then that was the thing I probably spent the most time on in the last six months with my colleagues is, you know, run the numbers, look at the turnout you're expecting, how many people are going to vote by mail, and do you have the capacity to process those in the time you have allocated? Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that right now when it's quiet, you want to figure out what the rules are. And you want to make sure that uh, your policies and procedures are up to date and, and ready and are being consistently applied across your state. For example, voter intent. Uh, we can all remember back to 2000 when that became the hot button issue in Gore v. Bush. And uh, that's what the lawyers love. They come into your, your state and they look at counties and they're making sure that every county is doing the same thing, treating every signature the same no matter what. And if there's any difference or discrepancy, uh, that's where they're going to hone in on and the public will focus in on. On. And then the third is just accountability. Um, you know, we had in the polling places, people who were issued provisional ballots that were counted that shouldn't have been. We had trays of absentee ballots that were missing and then found and re-entered into the system. And all of those mistakes add up to what appears to the average voter is at a minimum incompetence and at most voter fraud. So right. it's very important that you have your, your capacity, your controls, and then your consistency in applying them. Ben, why don't you go ahead there? I mean, we have now we see like what kind of the lessons that we've learned in these close recount type elections. I know you were involved, you know, some of these close ones, let's just say as well. So if we are to go into a possible 1876 scenario, what would that look like? Um, what are your general apprehensions and your observations? And ultimately, as a country, how could we come out of that and still trust each other? Uh, great question. Well, I think there are any number of scenarios that would lead you to something like 1876 when the Electoral College was uncertain and it got thrown to the the um, the Congress to, to actually try right. and sort it out or, or negotiate um, with each other. But I think what the secretary mentioned, which is the equal protections, protection charges and trying to maintain consistency when there are so many different jurisdictions counting. I mean, one of the lessons from uh, the Minnesota recount with Coleman and Franken was that even if every county gets precisely the same instructions and in training from the Secretary of State, there are attitudinal differences between the clerks in those counties on whether uh, there ought to be a strict interpretation of the requirements of state law or it's better to, to enfranchise more people and let all ballots or close to all ballots count. And it's really, really tough to get consistency between jurisdictions. But the problems will arise uh, if there is um, difficulty coming to a resolution in a state about who's won. And there are a number of question ballots. Over signatures is a good suspect for that, but there are other... Um, there are other uh, things that could be such as postmarks or any number of, of other things. Remember that in Florida, the recount process itself was underway under Florida law easily within a week of the election, that the results right. were razor thin, but it was in the recount method. And the what would be really difficult is if the volume of absentee ballots this time pushed off an outcome determinant of states ability to even start the recount and how that would be done uh, in time with the deadlines in the Electoral Count Act, which is what came out of the 1876 election. So if a state does not have its slate of electors determined because the, the results are still uncertain, that's where you get into the different scenarios of can a legislature step in? is uh, the passing of a slate of electors when there are no elect election results really the province of the legislature or is it a piece of legislation that involves the governor? Many of the battleground states have split control between the governorship and the legislature. So what does that mean? Um, part of the question is, uh, will the Congress be controlled by one party or split control? If the House and the Senate are under the control of one party, 
you can see a, a resolution to the messiness of not having a majority in the Electoral College determined uh, eat more easily than if there's divided control. Right. And you've got the deadlines. Uh, got to be done by the time the uh, Electoral College meets in mid-December. Uh, you've got another deadline of January 6th when the House is supposed to compute the Electoral College results. You certainly have an absolute deadline on noon and January 20th when the president and vice president's terms expire. Lonnie, what's your general perspective on that scenario in terms, but well, not just on that scenario, on the many scenarios in which we could get into some sort of fracas after the election, during the election, uh, you know, before the election and going into inauguration day. And in general, how would they be resolved, do you think, or uh, can they be resolved, do you think, in a way where the majority of the American people accept the results on January 20th, 2021? Well, you know, part of the what will allow the American people or the majority of the American people to accept the results is an understanding of what's happening every step along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we, we go back to that theme of transparency, which I think is very important. Um, I, I, uh, I had the pleasure of having been on my podcast uh, last week, and we talked about some of these scenarios that were that were very close. And, and he made the very good observation that you'd have to have many factors come together to generate a truly contested scenario. In other words, you'd really have to see a, a number of different things happening for it to get to a situation uh, that 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 was truly contested and was close enough in the right states to result in some of these scenarios. Look, one of the things I would say is um, there have been many ways in which the Congress has been disappointing over these last many years. Its inability to act uh, in any kind of bipartisan way to do things, for example, like there's been a recommendation that was made in, uh, in a piece in the Hill uh, that, uh, that, that was made actually by, uh, by Garrett Johnson, who's the founder mm -hmm. of the Lincoln Network, arguing for the creation of a bipartisan commission to oversee the election. That would have been a great thing for Congress to have been able to do, to come together to say, look, we actually need to get some people who know what they're doing, people like Ben and, and Secretary Wyman together and figure out, you know, hey, what are we doing that's right and wrong to make sure that, that this election goes off in a way that has public confidence but also ensures that people's voices are heard. Of course, Congress couldn't get its act together and they couldn't do it. And it's disappointing. And I think it's shameful, frankly, that they had the opportunity and the time to do it, to actually get together and try and restore public trust and confidence, even a little measure. And they just didn't get it done. Um, that, that, that's disappointing. But, you know, now it's too late for that. A week until the election, we've got to do uh, our best. I think those of us who comment on the election, who talk about it, who think about it, to reinforce to people that, Yes, it is possible we'll have these close scenarios. Yes, it's possible the election will be close. We are a divided country. But uh, that does not necessarily mean because it is close, because we are a divided country, that the outcome is illegitimate. And, and I think contributing to that conversation and doing our best to, to play a role in that, I think, is, is crucial. So this is what I wanted to end out with. We've got about 10 minutes left here. I don't see any audience questions yet. So if you have those, please send them in, and then we will answer them here if they're good. And... I, the one I'd like to hear just from all of you in these remaining 10 is a, a little bit more on what Lonnie was talking about, which is what Washington could have done to make this smoother. Um, what might states, others, you know, us as uh, commentators and observers and uh, officials, what could we know and learn from this pandemic already um, in order to incorporate into the next election process? Madam Secretary, let me start with you. Well, I think Lonnie, he hit it on the head uh, that in what I think is the biggest uh, threat to American democracy in our election system is partisanship, ironically. And mm -hmm. we really saw it in the beginning back in April, Congress was very just responsive. They immediately released $400 million to states for COVID-19 uh, relief in the CARES Act. And states were able to put that on the ground and, and really make their you know in-person voting systems and their absentee systems stronger and, and better for the elections that were happening in the spring. And then both sides started to posture for what I assume they thought was going to be negotiation. So they they dug in on voter suppression and voter fraud, the, the same you know, arguments we've had in every election since uh, at least 2000. And 
they staked out that territory in a way that basically said, unless you do it exactly the way we want, there's just no room to solve this COVID-19 impact. And, you know, we had uh, the bipartisan policy center and the Brennan center who said somewhere between two and $4 billion were needed on the ground in election offices across the country to be able to deal with COVID in a way that would make voting safe for everyone, for the workers, for the voters, and we could have a safe election. And unfortunately, because of that entrenched position both sides took, they couldn't even agree on a number, let alone get any legislation passed. And I think we had so many missed opportunities there of it, what could have been a bipartisan solution had to be a bipartisan solution. And now we have a, a situation where First of all, half the country is not going to believe the results because they're not going to like them. And then you add on top of that, uh, this this just rhetoric on both sides that the only explanation for our team losing right. is voter fraud. And the only explanation is voter suppression. That's a problem. It certainly is. Ben, go ahead. Uh, well, I want to take up on that fraud uh, versus suppression mm -hmm. uh, argument. And um, what we should take away from this uh, election is the realization that that's really a bad discussion to have. Because one way or another, uh, it, it, what, it, what it does is it's designed to, to energize the base instincts, the base of each party. And the people who are not base voters, who are low propensity voters, I think here the fraud and suppression back and forth and kind of decide not to participate because then it becomes a big hassle and and probably confrontational. So if our turnout is only 55%, and even if it skyrockets up to 65% uh, this time as a, as a country, that's shockingly right. low. And it should be a message to our officials that you, you can't, you can't go there with the argument. And that's something that, that, should be a bipartisan agreement. Um, the fact that when Republicans won so many legislatures in 2010, they put in a series of election laws they believed would be helpful to the party, voter registration uh, uh, requirements, uh, voter ID requirements. I mean, you know, you know the mm -hmm. list. Democrats did the same thing when they took over New Jersey and Nevada in uh, 2018 and put through universal mail balloting, which to the extent the president has an argument on absentee voting, it is about uh, just imposing universal mail balloting all of a sudden on a state not used to it. Uh, but but the, that litigation should be used as an example of how we've gotten ourselves in the wrong place in terms of a participatory democracy, where every qualified voter ought to be able to vote without barriers. Lonnie, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, ultimately we will need to figure out what the right balance is because one of the things is, you know, technology makes our lives better in so many different ways. And, and yet in many different areas, we've, we've come to see some of the challenges created by that technological innovation, whether it's getting information, but then having to deal with misinformation or disinformation. Certainly, you know, the way we participate in this democracy is an area where you would think we could use some technological transformation, but with that transformation comes uh, some sense that, well, maybe uh, maybe that makes us more vulnerable to Russian or Iranian or Chinese influence, and then how do we deal with that? The story of the next four years, in my mind, after this election is going to be, how do we continue to bring technology in to our electoral process in a way that we can trust is secure, that also makes our lives easier, but that also makes it easier for people to do what, what Ben and Secretary Wyman and people across the political spectrum should agree on, which is people who are eligible to vote in, in every election should be expressing their, their point of view. That's what makes democracy strong. And providing a technological platform and a way to do that so people can do it easier, but do it with confidence that their voice is being heard accurately in the right way. Uh, that should be the effort that we really devote ourselves to over these next four years and, and not have a situation where we're in a 2024 election cycle talking a week before the election right. about how to make things better. It, it's I just not going to work. I completely agree with that. And so we have two uh, audience questions here, which I think 
are very interesting. This one, um, Ben, I, or actually, Madam Secretary, I'll shoot this one to you from Sean Roberts. There has been a lot of question in from election information available this year. How would the panel rate the ability of local election offices to communicate with their off with their voters? Um, since you're the only elected official here, uh, I'll throw that one to you. Oh, you know, it's it's the, the challenge of 2020 is there's so much that has been put upon uh, every one of us, but certainly election officials in just having to change plans that they made two to four years ago for this election um, on the fly throughout this entire year. And so election information, you know, the Secretaries of State Association and Election Directors Association nationally have a hashtag called Trusted Info 2020. And that idea was to try to have trusted news partners, trusted uh, sources of information at the state and local level. Um, but you're hitting the the challenges, trying to get the election done and make all of those changes in, in potentially state law, uh, or local rules, getting that information to voters has been a challenge, and and uh, we're all just trying to get stuff and in, information out on you know web pages and social media, and uh, we're just swimming as fast as we can at this point. <laughs> I wish I had yeah. a better answer than that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Sean. Uh, either Ben or Lonnie, maybe both of you here. This is about the Supreme Court decision. You say this is Joshua Hoffman. How might last night's Supreme Court decision affect the chances that all mail ballots? will be counted in Wisconsin and other states. Ben, I assume you're familiar with the case. Um, go ahead, and Lonnie will have yours as well. I am. Well, the, the Supreme Court uh, decided that federal courts should not uh, overrun or overturn the decisions of elected legislators, which the court has been relatively consistent about. And so it said that all ballots have to be received by the 8 p.m. on Election Day uh, deadline that is part of Wisconsin law. There was an attempt uh, in a Democratic lawsuit with some judges that agreed to extend that deadline to six days after the close, the close of the election. So that now um, voters will have to get their absentee ballots into their polling places by, six, by 8 p.m. on election day, as opposed to having them postmarked on election day, but able to be received um, uh, six days afterwards. Uh, so that means, I think, that there will be uh, a number of ballots that will not be counted on time uh, or will not be counted because right. they arrive late. And on the other hand, uh, what it does mean is that Wisconsin is likely to get its results uh, out and done sooner so that the post-election chaos that we've sort of touched on uh, in which a number of people are worried about, the chances of that are reduced by the rule. Lonnie, go ahead. And this will be our last uh, our last one because I know we've got to get everybody out of here. Go ahead, Lonnie. Oh, I think you're muted. I don't hear him. Um, maybe it's just one more. Well, it's, uh, I lost his audio for some reason. Um, I think I've still got everybody or everybody else. I'm not sure about that. Uh, Man, he is articulate as yeah. always. <laughs> well, I know he has his own podcast with Ben, so everybody go check that out. Um, and I, I'll leave it uh, there. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us, Madam Secretary, Ben, Lonnie. This was a really interesting conversation over the thank last you. hour. And thanks to everybody out there who joined us and to the Lincoln Nor Network for hosting this amazing conversation. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.